Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you again for joining our next live. I think this is our fourth one now. Um, I'm just going to dial Alistair in, which means I'm going to have my concentrating face on for a minute. And I'm already getting some waves from people watching us, so thank you so much. Really exciting. Well, good afternoon. Here. How are you? Oh, hello. I'm good. I'm really sad that we're not in the same place, which uh, yesterday, last week we managed to, to do this live together in the office. And this week I've managed to catch COVID. So um, I'm at home isolating, but I'm feeling fine. So uh, as we and say, I'm the show must go on. Because I haven't got COVID and I don't want it. <laughs> You're getting done. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Well, we've already got lots of people joined us, so I guess let's, um, let's get going. So this live is all about the um, power of play. And I think play is one of those things that's often undervalued and misunderstood um, and can be seen as a little bit frivolous, really. And I think we know, as uh, people sort of grounded in the early years, just how effective um, play is um, to underpin children's development. So I think this live is going to be really interesting exploring all of those topics. And we've had loads of brilliant questions um, sent in beforehand, which is fabulous. But I'm going to start with something really simple, which is, um, what is it about play that makes it so Basically, important for children? Play is important for all of us adults and children alike. And I think certainly as an educator and having had an entire career in education, when I was teaching, for me, play was often something, even in the early years, the children did either before they did some learning with a teacher or an adult or after to kind of finish them off and keep them busy. And actually what we know about play is it's scientifically, preschools, when we were all kind of human beings learning to be human beings, play is the way that we would have learned about life. So like animals in the animal kingdom use play because play allows you to experiment with feelings, emotions. It allows you to try things out in really safe and secure spaces. It allows you to develop your verbal skills, your non-verbal skills, your social interactions. And also when you're playing, true play is self-motivated, self-initiated. So children tend to be really heavily engaged when they're at play. And when you've got really heavy engagement with children, that's a massive opportunity for progress and learning and attainment and interaction. So play is physiologically and cognitively really effective for your development as a basic human being. And when we know when children are at play, more areas of their brain light up simultaneously, so are active, than they are in any other singular task. So when you are playing, you not only have to use the knowledge you've already got and rehearse and consolidate that, you're actively inventing new knowledge based on the things that are happening around you. So the more children can play, the better. I think you're right. I think play is often seen as something you need to get done and out of the way so that proper learning can commence. But we all know that this really is what proper learning is all about in the early years. Did Jenny disappear then, like magic? Did I disappear? <laughs> I was saying, oh, that's a shame because we've invested in real high quality Wi-Fi and it's not, it's not playing ball, but never mind. Um, I was saying that play is often something that you want to get done and out of the way so that yeah. real learning can commence. We all know that it is, and there's a difference between real play and activities. We might get a chance to explore that later on. And again, for parents, often you feel like you've got to set things up for your children to create opportunities for them to paint or draw or do, and those things can be good. But also, if you think about interactions that you have, and also time for children just to be on their own and play on their own, there's often loads more value in the spontaneous, self initiated play then there is often in those structured activities that take you an hour to set up. Children spend like 30 seconds doing them, then you take an hour to clear away, and you wonder why have I done this in the first place, when actually just an opportunity to organically play probably would have been better. I think there's a couple of things I want to under, unpin there a little bit. One of them is the sort of pressure parents feel to keep children entertained all the time, and actually boredom or a little bit of boredom anyway is not such a bad thing so well maybe there's a very famous phrase that i'm going to paraphrase and i can't remember who said it it's that famous which is boredom is the mother of invention and that's a real truth 
Because often with children, if you're out somewhere or you're in a space and you're in the garden, in your lounge, in the park, whatever, they're very unlikely for them to sit there for an hour and just sit there and say, well, I couldn't think of anything to do. Children will invent their own play and they create their own opportunities to play because it's innate in who we are as human beings. So often when you are really getting children to engage in self-initiated play through a little bit of boredom, that's when they've got to use all their grey matter, they've got to be inventive, uh, rather than saying, right, here's an activity, let's sit down and do this. So a little bit of boredom is a very good thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can you know, stick them in another room and then disappear for a couple of hours, but it's about not always thinking, I've got to have something planned or I've got to have something organised. You don't. And often the most ambiguous resources are the best ones to use. I think you really opened my eyes to that. As I've said before, I've got um, three children, two of which are older and adults now, and one that's 11. But Olivia came along when I was beginning to really understand the early years because I was running a children's day nursery. And you, you said to me, a bit of boredom is not a bad thing. And I remember quite often, um, sort of with my other children, feeling a real... A sort of panic that I needed to keep them busy and active all the time and actually with Olivia who's the younger one I quite often if she would say what we're we going to do now I say I don't know what do you think and sort of back when she was that little bit older obviously you can't say this to a baby but to a you know a preschooler to pass it back yeah. and say oh I don't know what do you think and give them opportunity to have a bit more Absolutely. thinking about what do they want to do I think the other thing I just wanted to touch on, you talked there about um, setting up activities and, and I think Instagram can really, really feed into this idea of creating these very beautiful looking activities for children. Um, but often, you know, you'll spend longer setting it up than the children will ever do playing with it. So talk to me about, we, we used to call them sort of provocations for learning. Um, but what's the reality of that? What really matters? When you've got opportunities to engage in free play, so when you are just giving your children a chance to interact with the resources that they've got or the space that they're in, and often that can be free resources or things as simple as you know sticks in a cardboard box, and we talk about that a lot in my first five years. And when we are talking about the development of children in the app, we do give lots and lots of opportunities and examples of activities and interactions that you can do with children. And some of them are about making it more open-ended. So we're not often suggesting activities that are cut this out or make this out of a paper plate. They're often about activities and interactions that are making parents think about how you can offer your children the kind of maximum potential. But there are things you can do that are sometimes called invitations to play or provocations to play. So things that can provoke children's interest or their learning. But then there are set up activities where you might say, you know, we're going to make a penguin out of a toilet roll tube and I've downloaded the instructions off the Internet. And, you know, basically then what you've got is children just sticking things that you've cut out for them onto a toilet roll tube. And it's an activity with an end point and it's very, very structured. Whereas actually, if you said to children, here's some creative resources, let's see what we can make with those, whether that be paint or crayons or mud or whatever it may be, then you've got that the provocation can be really open-ended and open to interpretation. And the more open-ended it is, the more engaged children tend to be. Yeah, it's letting go of that control, isn't it, that yeah. we have as parents to want to sometimes be an act and something that we look at and go, isn't that amazing, isn't it pretty? But actually, the more amazing and prettier it is, the more likely that we as adults have probably over engaged in that activity and not really given the child the space to, to lead and, and learn themselves. Um, I think that's one of the questions we've got actually, I've just sort of led into that without realising, which is when to join in and when to watch. I think that's a really um, good question that one of the parents has It is, it's a really good question and it's not one that's always got a definitive answer to it because those two situations are the same. And I think watching is really good as a parent because you learn all sorts about your child's interests and how they play and their language development by watching. And sometimes by interacting, we can over control their play. And I think one for all of us as parents, one of the things you've got to really try and let go of is your assumption of what's going to happen. Because what you assume is going to happen is probably not what's ever going to happen in any kind of situation around play. You want children to have that real high level of creativity. So 
as a parent, it's about thinking, right, I'm going to let the child lead. And if I see an opportunity to support them or to scaffold their learning a bit or to ask an open-ended question, then I'm going to do that. But if they're really happy and engrossed and engaged in their play, I'm not going to interrupt it by saying, oh, that's a lovely tower. How many bricks are in your tower? Shall we count them? One, two, because then your child just learns like, oh, it's the how many question again. I just wanted to build a tower. And it's things like when they've made a picture, not saying, what is it? Because if you say to a child, what is it? You're clearly telling them that you have no idea what it is they've done. So I would always say things like, oh, I, you know, I love it. Tell me about your favorite bit. How did you make that? I love the fact you've chosen that color. Tell me about some of the other things you've used. So rather than say, what is it? Well, it doesn't look like that. Uh, say, just talk about the process and say how pleased you are with your, you've spent a long time on that. You've showed real commitment to that. Oh, that, I love this. I'm going to stick it on the fridge, whatever it may be. So it's all those questions that are going to build confidence around children, but also in terms of when to kind of interact and when to watch. It's just a playing a, an ongoing game. And sometimes you get it very right and sometimes you get it very wrong. And I think all parents, all early years practitioners do that, where sometimes you think, oh, this is a golden moment for teaching opportunity. And you intervene and they literally scatter, like, oh, no, we're going to get some teaching here. And then other times it comes spontaneously and you get some brilliant stuff out of it. So just experiment. And if things don't go according to plan, don't beat yourself up too much. Just reflect it and think, well, probably should have backed off a bit there. And next time, I'll think about it slightly differently. We talk a lot in all of our lives, actually, about the importance of the language we use with, with children and, and how important it is to build their confidence at this very early stage and not be over-managing and over-correcting and, and more model and, and clock that maybe something you're going to come back to at a later date rather than feeling everything needs to be addressed and I know in I every moment there and then. One of the key principles for us in that the app is that we are trying to help parents to notice the moments and how significant the moments are. So rather than thinking, well, they haven't made a picture yet or they're not playing like this yet, it's about saying, oh, but they are doing this. And the fact that they chose to do that and the fact they were able to do that, that's really significant in their development. And it's those things that parents might miss because you're not aware of what they are that the app really supports you with and says right look at this this is what that links to and here are some activities you can do to support that so noticing those moments and not just the big milestones is really crucial and it makes you as a parent relax a bit and you think actually they're doing loads of stuff now that i know what i'm looking for so i can take a breath i can chill out a bit and we're not in that kind of constant race, which you often feel like you're in as a parent, especially with Instagram and Facebook, to get your child to a space where it appears everybody else's child is. And actually, in truth, they're probably not. Yeah, there's so one pick there, and I'm wondering where to go next with it. But I think the first thing I'm going to do is just ask you to explain to everyone a little bit about the different sorts of play and, and that children tend to, to sort of progress yeah, through so there are from birth stages onwards, really. of play and they're not really linked to particular ages so what we want to be really careful about and again it's what we talk about it runs through the core of my first five years we're not about assigning development to an age we're about assigning development to the unique journey of a child so it's hard to say by the age of two your child will no longer do this because you get some two-year-olds that are just two you get some two-year-olds that are nearly three and you can get two-year-olds that are just two but have the development of a typical three-year-old and vice versa so we talk about stages of kind of play development where children will start off being very much in solitary play and that is where they're not really interested in what's going on around them. It's about them finding a great deal of interest and fascination in the discovery of the world in front of them. So that element of play is usually fairly early on in their development. And that's that kind of fascination with objects and putting them in your mouth and all that kind of stuff that goes on. Then you kind of move into onlooker play, which is where you'll see children who are slightly further down the journey watching other children play. So they will sit and literally just watch what's going on. And again, that's perfectly normal. Sometimes parents worry, should my child be joining in? Should I try and get those children to join in with my child? And again, you know, it is a very common stage of development where children are just learning play habits because you need to learn socially how to play. And I talked a little bit earlier on about things like verbal cues and non-verbal cues. 
So all the really subtle stuff like facial expressions, body language, you learn that by watching and, and interacting. So then children tend to move into parallel play where they will play beside another child, but not with. So they're in the same space. They're sometimes sharing resources, but they're not in shared play. Um, then you kind of move into associative play where there's some interaction in their place. So they might share a resource, they might share a look, they might share a bit of conversation, but you wouldn't say they were playing together. And then you get cooperative play at the end, which is a child and other children or child that are engaged in play that is clearly them playing together where you get those lovely scenarios where they spend more time discussing the rules than they do playing the actual game. I'm going to do that and you're going to go there or they change the rules all the time. And that lovely thing where children do it where they change the rules to win. So now I've got three boys and when they were little, they constantly just change the rules all the time. So one of them would win and then the others felt it was really unfair. But the resolution of that injustice was really important. So letting children fall out in play and then fall back in again is really important. And as an adult, being able to show them how to resolve a conflict effectively through play is teaching lessons for later life that are going to be really useful. Absolutely. Certainly some of the lives in the future are really going to be touching on that sort of conflict, uh, how to support children. So we'll have to come back to that another time, just because this topic on its own is so huge I'm going to keep us focused on it um, we've had another question come through which I'm just reading out here which is how can I move my child on when they get stuck in parallel play so there's a few interesting bits there to is, and there I think anyway fundamentally the, the key message is not to worry because they are stages of development and we have um, talked before and we've got lots of information on our website about schematic play and how children will go into some play habits that they repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat until they've processed them physically and emotionally and then they move on so if you've got a child who's a parallel player then they it means that for their development and again remember for phases and stages of development some children stay in them for very brief moments some children stay in them for quite elongated periods of time so it could just be that's exactly where they are and the best thing to do is allow them to stay within that space, because if you try to move them out of it with all the best intention, what you're probably going to do is raise their anxiety because they are not developmentally ready to move into the next phase of co-play. So therefore, they become anxious about it. So you can model it as an adult. You can play with them in different ways in that kind of adult and child interaction. But for me, I would say kind of hold your nerve, see it as a phase of development and um, celebrate where they are within it and they will usually move out of it. Absolutely and somebody's just popped up a question there that they're really fascinated about these different stages of play and whether there's any more information well that's all in the yeah. PDF isn't it whenever we do a live we do a PDF as well that you can download so um, in the bio of the Insta um, you can log on and get the um, downloadable PDF in more because we're an app and a company today. that is literally steeped in play, if you go on our website, which is myversefiveyears.com, and look at our articles and blogs, there's loads of extra stuff around just the science of play and how ace it is. .com, that's very true. I knew yeah. that as soon as I said it. It's because I'm reading what's written behind me. <laughs> we get to say it twice, that's all right. MFY.com. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. So um, another question has come in is ideas for outdoor play where there is no equipment available. So the best outdoor play is where there is no equipment available. So outdoor play is good for like it's everything. It's good for sensory development because you're feeling the weather, you're feeling the rain, the wind, the hail, the sleet, the snow. It's really good for your physical development, gross and fine motor. It's good for cognitive development because you're problem solving. It's good for mathematical development because it's shape and sorting. There's just loads of stuff. So Again, boredom can be useful in an outdoor space. So getting children to literally find things to do. Children will always engage in things like role play and small world play. So small world play being like puppets, characters, that kind of stuff. So you can make really simple things like get a leaf and a stick and just thread the stick through the leaf and make a set of little hand puppets, which are just different shaped leaves that have got different characters. And you may have to help with the threading of the stick. 
you can collect stuff. So if you've got, take an egg box with you, always good to have an egg box in your bag when you go out because they're brilliant for collecting stuff. Uh, but if you haven't got an egg box, if you've got an elastic band, wrap it around the end of a stick and then children can insert things into the elastic band. Just make sure you take the elastic band home with you and don't leave it out there. Things like lying on your back and looking at clouds, seeing shapes, uh, all sorts of stuff in terms of weather and looking at rain and water and where it falls and what's waterproof and what's not. There's literally take a lead from your child. There's physical stuff you can do like gross mortar. You can create obstacle courses and you can do things like have sticks in the grass and say you've got to leap over the stick. You've got to balance walk along the twig. So you don't have to be moving logs and have your know, big stuff. It can be really inventive, but use what you've got and use that kind of inventiveness that comes from children when they haven't got anything. Listening to birds, all sorts of stuff. And I think as well, most of us have got access to a, a local park. And I know I used to love taking Olivia to the, to the park. And one of the things I would do, again, just because I began to understand that the more you let them do, the more they're going to learn from the experience. But I'd quite often stand back that little bit and let her figure out herself which equipment she could use, which equipment was appropriate, and, and sort of let her think about the, the risks a little bit and try things, not to a dangerous level. I'm not saying I'd let her climb up something and fall off and hurt herself, but I would definitely stand back and let her explore the environment a little bit herself. And I was quite aware that there were other parents really sort of on the children and not really letting them do much. And they must have been looking at me thinking I was being a bit lazy when I knew <laughs> I was something that was really helping my child. So just talk ever so slightly about risky play because I think it's worth we alive are fun and alive and own, really. so right around risky play because the element of taking a risk there are different sorts of risk and we'll go into that in more detail in our live so these are small calculated risks and they're risks that are in the moment and children need to learn to manage risk they need to recognize that not in the top of their stomach when they're standing at the top of the slide do I slide down do I not slide down also, what I have often done with parents is the be careful challenge. So you say to them, when you go to the park, you cannot yeah. go to the phrase, be careful, in any way, shape or form, because you find you do it almost subconsciously. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. You can't say be careful. So, and again, we'll talk about this on the live, but what can you say instead that empowers children to make those decisions without parents? Because if you keep constantly saying be careful to your child, you are clearly indicating that you think there is a high element of risk and therefore they will not take that risk. So it's about using language around thinking, using the language around what you know. There's lots of really good phrases that you can use with children that aren't be careful. But a good challenge when you're next out with your child in an open space is how many times you say be careful because you will be surprised at how many times you do. But when children learn to manage risk on this level, it really supports them with their risk management later on in life. And there have been studies around teenagers and the decisions that they make and how good their levels of risk management are. And so the more experience they can have of managing risk safely really influences how you make decisions about risk and what that risk might be later on in your development. Yeah, no, completely agree. Another good question that's come through is that this uh, parent's little one is obsessed with cars and how can she encourage learning well, with this place? Again, the, we could just do a live on that one comment. So the obsession with cars is great. So it's a real, showing a real interest. That could well be a schematic play. It depends what the child is doing with the cars or if they've just found a fascination or an interest around cars. Because sometimes what happens is that because children get really positive feedback around. So, for example, and we're going to do a live on gender as well. But if we talk about gender, what you sometimes find is that gendered interests pass through families. So you might get a boy who's really interested in cars because they've got a dad who's really interested in cars. So when it comes to child development, that's a place where they meet on one level or another. And the child will see they get a really positive or sustained interaction from that particular parent around that particular interest. So therefore they begin to really develop that interest because they associate it with a positive interaction. So it's not a conscious thought, it's like a subconscious thought. So why children develop interests in particular things is fascinating, but it's often about the positive reinforcement they get around that particular thing. 
And, but also in terms of, if it's a real interest in cars, there's all sorts you can talk about in terms of the science, there's ramp building, there's speed at which cars can move or not move, why it moves on round wheels, not square wheels, even down to the how many of you got the sorting, the categorizing. And I wouldn't make everyday car day school because then children lose interest. But yet yeah. you just get high levels of engagement are your routes to progress, attainment, and, and development. So capitalize on that engagement. Yeah. And, but not all the time, because then it, because yeah. they think yeah. a bit, don't they? And they just think, well. And also, you can take the cars into other areas of play. So rather than saying, oh, it's cars again. If you want to really develop that small world imaginative language development play, then as an adult, you can model the cars going into the garage for a service, the cars going into the town to pick up whatever it may be, who's going to get in and out of the car. So you can use the car as a vehicle, see what I did there, to move into other areas of play development, which you would scaffold as an adult, but really still base it around their interest. So I'm not saying just play with cars exclusively and nothing else. You can dilute that kind of car fascination by moving it into other areas as well. Even down to things like paint the wheels of your cars and run them across big sheets of paper and make some fantastic car track art or take them outside and do it in mud. So there's all sorts of things you can do that use that kind of interest and fascination. Yeah, yeah. that obsession could be with anything, couldn't it? This example this parent has shared is with cars, but children can often um, you know, have, have a, a type of thing that they become really, really interested in. And it's a great opportunity then to ground some learning into that interest. sometimes children interested in cars or bikes because they've got a rotational schema, which is really common. So children are fascinated by things that rotate and turn. So they get really obsessed with wheels, which translates itself through cars because they're the things they've got in the house that have got wheels. But actually, what they're fascinated by is the rotation. So you can even bring in other things that yeah. rotate and see if it's linked to that kind of rotational schematic play, which again is about children carrying out this play pattern again and again and again until they've processed it physically and cognitively and then they tend to move on. Remind me of another PDF we have that you can yeah. download, which is all around schematic play. And I know that's been a really popular download because it's something that all you know children present these, these um, these ways of being and it's great for parents to have a bit of a deeper understanding of that. Um, a few more questions, I'm aware time is pressing on, but I think this is quite an interesting question, which is the best play for learning age. Now, as I ask that question, I know it's a loaded question, but it's genuinely been asked because a big passion of ours is to really try and move away from talking about ages and more to talk about where the child is at. So Maybe we can just have a yeah, it is just about a thinking bit. about stages of development, but also play is multi-layered. So there are all sorts of different sorts of play we play. If you think about play as rehearsing to be a human being, and there are so many aspects of human beings from emotion to language to physical development, social interaction. So there are threads of play that link to all of those things. So play is really complex and children play in different ways at different times. So you'll get children who are really good at solitary imaginative play so they can make up fantastic stories about amazing things, but they're not very good at co-play with somebody else. They're not very good at social interaction or they're not a team player. So they really struggle when it is those games where there are more than two or three children who are playing together. So it just depends where your child is in that particular aspect of play and what you can do to support them, which is usually give them more opportunities to engage in that sort of play, but also model it as an adult. So it's about adults getting back to our kind of inner child and not necessarily playing like a child, but modeling effective play. And when we go back to things like conflict resolution, it's again about not adults stepping in and saying, right, stop, you go and sit over there, you go and sit over there, blah, blah, blah. Or saying, right, let's all be friends because we're all friends because everybody in the world is all friends with each other because there will come a day when children suddenly realise that everybody in the world is not all friends with each other. It's about saying, right, we've got a disagreement here. How can we resolve it? How can we find a way out of that that's fair? And by modelling that as an adult repeatedly, then children learn that process. And I guess without overplaying, um, 
our last 12 months work the whole purpose of the app is to really help parents to understand the power of play and literally there are daily um, activity ideas within the app that are really really simple they're not insta worthy it's not about that it's about really simple ideas that you can typically offer your child with either what's in the environment outside the front door or in the cupboards in the house but really simple and effective um, play ideas based on exactly where they are um, right now so um, it's definitely worth having a download peeps it's um, it's a 14 day free trial at the moment as well so there's nothing to lose just uh, download it from the bio and we'd love to get it. Go on. Um, a couple more questions um, is TV really that bad sometimes I just need 20 minutes to myself but I feel really bad leaving him well, to watch the TV there's good TV and there is bad TV there are good lengths of time there are bad lengths of time there's got to be a bit of judgment in there we talk a lot in my first five years about realistic parenting and realistic parenting being that you are realistic about the fact that you are a human being you have a life the world gets in the way of the perfect parent and there is no such thing so all of us sometimes need 20 minutes or slightly more just to catch our breath or go to the loo or feed the dog or unpack the shopping or whatever it may be so yeah if you're sitting your child down obviously you think about what you sit them down in front of some of the things you might sit them down in front of because they just love it they've got zero educational value but it gives the child a great sense of enjoyment some things you might sit them down in front of because it's got an educational element to it and you think they're going to enjoy that. So I think if we're saying, is it okay to sit my child in front of the telly for three hours a day and just let them watch, then the answer's probably no. Uh, for various reasons, which are not just about what they're watching, it's also about the light the televisions emit, it's about how it engages with their brain, it's about how they engage with the process. But if we're saying, is television okay, you know, within reason, then and the content is is reasonable and i think the answer is yes absolutely it is there was some cracking ones that my kids loved there was one called blues clues you never see that on the telly anymore but um, my eldest one used to absolutely love blues clues and then there was another one i can't remember its name at the moment there was um a lady that used From to outside. fly around in a, a little airplane with a dog Come outside. oh gosh i love that one as well because i used to learn how things made, but we'd sit together and really, really enjoy that one. And to me, that was educational and and really valuable. And not just it wasn't a bit of downtime, but for me, it was very much guilt free because I thought it was brilliant and I enjoyed it as well. Somebody, Blues Clues is still well, on. It's on Channel Five. Who knew? Kevin from Blues Clues in my boys' day it now presents on the one show occasionally. And I said to my eldest son, "That's Kevin from Blues Clues." But yeah, I saw caught a bit of a remake, and it's somebody else that's doing it. It's not. It's not the same guy. It's not the same. I say you must yeah, be getting on a great. little bit now because uh, that was years ago that my little one was enjoying that. Um, okay, I think given the time, we probably need to wrap. But we could talk about play for hours and hours. So I think we probably just do more and more. Um, about play and we can just feel some of the men through but I'm just looking at what we're doing next week um, next week in becoming a talker and uh, that's on Tuesday the 1st of March at noon everything that we do we save and we pop up on Instagram TV and on YouTube so if you've missed it or you want to share it with other people then you can do um, we love the fact we have so many people following those li these lives we get some lovely feedback afterwards don't forget about the PDF. You can download um, the PDF, which is all about learning through the power of play. Um, all the PDFs from the previous lives are up there as well. And as I say, right now, we're doing 14 days free trial of the app. So we'd encourage you all to download that. And you, when you download it, you tell the app about your child, where your child is up to. We don't talk about any one you know, age or stage. We get to know about your child. And once we know about your child, start to offer play ideas and interactions and activities that are going to really help the learning. So we hope you'll love it and um, keep tuning in for our future lives. Yeah, we say see you now, Alistair. See you, everybody. Lovely. Thank you for Bye. joining, everybody.